भगवते वसुदेवाया ओम नमो भगवते वसुदेवाया नमो भगवते सुदेवाया ओम ज्ञान तुमरंद ज्ञानंजना शलाकाया चक्षुर मिलित तस्मय श्री गुरवे नम वंशकौपातरुभ्य कृपा सिंधु पथित नम पवान्ेभ्यो वैष्णवीभ्यो नमो नम नमा विष्णुपदा कृष्ण प्रेष्टा भूतले श्रीमाते भक्ति वेदांता स्वामी नामने नमस्ते सरस्वती देवे गौरवाणी प्रचारिणे निर्विशेष शून्यवारी पश्चातारिणे जय श्री कृष्ण चैतन्य प्रभु निनंद श्री अद्वैत गधाधार श्रीवासधि गौरभक्तबिंद हरे कृष्णा हरे कृष्णा कृष्ण कृष्ण हरे 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 राम हरे राम 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 हरे हरे सो वी वेलकम एवरी वन टू आर ऑन गोइंग सेशन ऑफ स्टडिंग श्री शुपानिषद येस्टुडे वी स्पोक अबाउट सम ऑफ द क्वालिटीज of the supreme personality of godhead particularly we were hearing about how the lord is shudam am apavidam shudam apavidam shudam apavidam right who knows the meaning what is the meaning of shudam antiseptic maharaj Okay, antiseptic. And then apap apapa vidam means prophylactic. Okay. Can you explain to me now how the Lord is antiseptic and it prophet prophylactic? Uh, yes, Maharaj. Uh Antiseptic is uh, uh, <laughs> is antiseptic in the sense that even an impure thing can become purified by just by touching. Right. Right. Something impure can be purified. Antiseptic. You have a you have some infection. You put some antiseptic on it. It will cure the disease. Right. So something is contaminated. Something dirty. Something impure. But the Lord can purify it. He can correct it. And prophylactic. Then. Refers to the power of His association, Lord. Yes, yeah, a power of His association. that even something which may be wrong that becomes all right because it's krishna because krishna is prophylactic so his dancing with the young girls is prophylactic it's not there's no degradation in it because he's the lord so even you know krishna does so many tricks he does things like he steals the butter and he left the battlefield but all of these things these are his good qualities he's glorified for that and so he he's not he's he's not degraded by it because he's prophylactic whatever he does it it's all right it's 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 correct because he's the lord himself 
So whatever he does is transcendental. So he has so many wonderful qualities. So this is his nature, that he can kill the demons. And kill the demons, the demons get liberated. By his killing them, they get liberated. So that's a blessing for the demons when Krishna comes and kills them. Everyone who died on the battlefield of Kurukshetra, they got liberated because they were dying in the presence of Krishna. So this is Krishna's wonderful qualities. Krishna in the Bhagavad Gita says, Surrender to me, I will free you from all sinful activities. Do not fear. So we take shelter of Krishna by association of Krishna, we become purified. We get delivered. So Krishna is, and Krishna is unembodied. Who can exp, Sachinandan, can you explain to me the meaning of unembodied? Krishna is unembodied. Hare Krishna Gurudev, um, Krishna can uh, see, Krishna can see through his mouth, uh, he can, uh, he can taste using his eyes, he is not uh, limited, his, uh, one sense can do the, the, the duty of the other sense. That's omnipotent, that's describing his omnipotency, omnipotency, but I want to know how he is, oh. how he is unembodied. Um. No, well, as well, as who knows, um. Let me see who's. Vishma, uh, uh, Maharaj, I would like to try. Mary, you want to try? Yeah. yeah. Um, unembodied, is it uh, without material body? That means there's no difference between his body and soul? Right. He has a body, but it's not a material body, right? Yes. Yeah, he has a spirit. Yeah. And, and with the spiritual body, Spiritual body is all spiritual, so there's no difference between the body and the soul and the mind. It's all spiritual. In our body there's a difference between the soul and the mind and the body, but for Krishna it's all, it's all spiritual. The body, the mind, soul, no difference, right? So he has a body, but he doesn't have a material body. He has a spiritual body. So he's unembodied. Not like a, we're embodied, we're in a material body. But Krishna has a, he, he's his own spiritual body. Okay? What about, we spoke earlier also about ekatvam anupashyata. Who remembers the meaning of that? Ekatvam anupashyata means uh, Maharaj, I would like to try. Is it mean? Is it what? Uh, is it mean uh, we are one in quantity but different in quantity with the Lord? Yeah. We're, like uh, one means? Yeah, we have a relationship with the Lord. We're one in quality with the Lord, right. We are His parts and parcels, one in quality, different in quantity. Okay, so thank you very much. So we'll go ahead, let me see. Can everyone see this? Yes, Maharaj. Very clear, Maharaj. Okay, good. Who would like to read for us? Ch chant the Sanskrit. Yeah, Hare Krishna Maharaj. I read Maharaj. Okay. 
Andam tama pravishanti. Andam tama pravishanti. Ye avidyam pasate. Ye vidyayam pasate. To puya iva te tamo. Ta to puya iva te tamo. Ye yo vidya ay. Yao Vidya Yam Rataha Okay, someone else, Jen? Can I try Maharaj? Yeah, please. Andam Tamaha Pravishanti Andam Tamaha Pravishanti E vidyam upasate. Ye vidya yam upasate. Tato buya ivate tamo. Tato buya ivate tamo. Ya yu vidya yam rataha. Ya yu vidya yam rataha. Okay. Someone else? One more, Chen. Andam tama pravishanti. Andam tama pravishanti. Ya o vidya yam rata ha. Okay, would you like to read now, Maharaji, the lady who just chanted? Who is it? What's your name? Nantini. Nantini. Okay, Nantini. Chan? Translation and purport by His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shula Prabhupada. Those who engage in the culture of nisayam activity shall enter into the darkest region of ignorance. First, kill out those engaged in the culture of so-called knowledge. Okay, what's nation activities? What does that mean? The culture uh, of nisayam. Ignorance? Yes. Is that Krishna consciousness? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you could describe? How to describe it? Nation. What it mentions it like enter into the dark. We're still uh, the culture of so-called knowledge. So there's so-called knowledge, and this is the culture of nations, nation activities. So nation activities means no knowledge, means ignorance. People who are just ignorant uneducated, don't know anything, <laughs> right? So the verse is saying, people who are cultivating, who, who, are, who are ignorant and don't know anything, they enter into the darkest region of ignorance. But the ones who have got so-called knowledge, they're even worse. Worse still are those engaged because they are in the culture the cult, they're, they're, they're trying to get more of the so-called knowledge, meaning so-called knowledge means not real knowledge, bogus knowledge, the wrong knowledge, not real, not genuine knowledge. So they're even worse off than the people who are just ignorant, who just don't know anything. Okay, Nantini, go ahead, read the purport. This mantra offers a comparative study of Vidya and Avidya. Avidya, or ignorance, is undoubtedly dangerous, but Vidya, or knowledge, is even more dangerous when mistaken or misguided. This mantra of Sri Ishopanishad is more applicable today than at any time in the past. Modern civilization has advanced considerably in the field of mass education, but the result is that people are more unhappy than ever because before, 
because of the stress placed on material advancement to the exclusion of the most important part of life, the spiritual aspect. Okay, thank you. So, Prabhupada saying two, ty two kinds of studies, the study of Vidya and the study of Avidya, right? Vidya. Now, just like in Bhagavad Gita, Krishna says, Raja Vidya, Raja Vidya, meaning king of knowledge. And here we have also, we have Vidya and Avidya. So Avidya is ignorance. So Prabhupada said it's dangerous, but Vidya even more dangerous. Of course, this Vidya, the one which is more de this is not the Vidya from the Bhagavad Gita. This is a this is a, the so-called vidya, the so-called knowledge, more dangerous when mistaken or misguided. So it could be the real knowledge, but when it's mistaken or misguided, that's the problem. So, this mantra of Sri Shopanishad, more applicable today than at any time in the past. Civilization has advanced, mass education, so many people get education, all work going to college and getting degrees and, you know, everybody well educated, speak very nicely, obviously you're well educated. But the result is people are more unhappy than ever before. Isn't it true? The modern life, did it make us more happy than people were before? Does it mean no. be, because we're living in a big city and because you're driving a car, does it mean you're more happy than you were before when you were living and maybe where, where we were living on the, on the plantation or something like that? And you know, or living some village somewhere, in, just in the village life, very simple, natural life, does it mean we're more happier now? Because you have a lot of makeup and you have money and you have your credit card and so many things. Does it mean we're happier? No. We're more unhappy than ever. Why? Because of the stress placed on material advancement. And we've forgotten the most important part of life, the spiritual aspect. So this is the problem. We're simply thinking only about material things, material advancement. We want bigger car, we want more expensive car, we want everything more more expensive. We should have more money, we should have more power. We want to go traveling to many countries, visit the foreign countries everywhere. So this is a material advancement. But the most important part of life, the spiritual aspect, to take care of the soul. We spend all the time taking care of the body, we've forgotten about the soul. So this is a problem. Okay, we need somebody to read the next paragraph. Who's, who's there to read next? Hare Krishna Maharaj, can I read? Okay, what's your name? Tanusha. Tanusha, yes, Tanusha, please read. As far as Vidya is concerned, the first mantra has explained very clearly that the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of everything and that forgetfulness of this fact is ignorance. The more a man forgets his fact of life, the more he is in darkness. In view of this, a godless civilization directed towards the so-called advancement of education is more dangerous than a civilization in which the masses of the people are less educated. 
Thank you. So the first mantra, have you memorized it yet, Tanusha? Did you memorize it? Uh, a bit, Maharaj. Go ahead, try and say it. Let me hear you say. Isavasham. Is Isavasham idam sarvam yatkin cha jagatyam jagat he na tyakte na bunjita makrada kashya sweet danam. Oh, yes, very good. Yeah, you've memorized it. And do you know the translation? Translation is have you everything no. anime. I, I don't want you I, I don't want you to read it. I want you to say it without looking at the book, right? <laughs> um, okay, uh, wait. I, I know you read very well, but I want to test your memory. <laughs> okay, uh, everything that is uh, created by the Lord is controlled by Him. Yeah. And then controlled by him and then uh, that's all I remember for now, Maharaj. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Everything animate and inanimate within the universe is controlled and owned by the Lord, right? One should therefore accept only those things necessary for himself and should not accept other things knowing well to whom they belong. Right? Krishna was speaking, take our quota, don't take more than what we need. Remember? Tanusha, are you there? Yes, Maharaj. Okay. So that was the, 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 the first part of saying Krishna is the proprietor and the second part said just take what you need, don't take more than you're supposed to have, right? Yes, Maharaj, yes. Okay, so here the, per, the Prabhupada is just referring to the first part that the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of everything. But forgetfulness of that fact is ignorance. When we forget Krishna is the proprietor, who do we think is the proprietor? Um, Maya? Yeah, we're thinking we are the proprietor, right? Yes, we're, yes. Thi we're thinking it's mine. We're thinking, yes. You know, the man thinks this, this woman is mine. And the woman thinks, this man is mine. <laughs> you know, we're both thinking, I'm the proprietor. The woman is thinking, the man is mine. The man is thinking, the woman is mine. Who is actually the proprietor? Everything belongs to the Supreme Lord. So when we forget that, that is the ignorance or the maya. The more a man forgets this fact, the more he is in darkness. In view of this, a godless civilization directed towards so-called advancement of education is more dangerous than the civilization where the masses of people are not so educated. So. Prabhupada is saying, better the people are not educated because when they get the education, if they are godless, it makes a big problem. If they don't believe in God, if they're atheistic, then it's a big problem for the whole world, right? <laughs> you go ahead, Tanusha, you read the next paragraph. Okay, uh, of the different classes of men, karmis, karmis, nyanis, and yogis, 
The karmis are those who are engaged in the activities of sense gratification. In the modern civilization, 99.9% .9 of the people are engaged in the activities of sense gratification under the flags of the industrialism, economic development, altruism, political activism, and so on. All these activities are more or less based on satisfaction of the senses. To the exclusion of the kind of God consciousness described in the first mantra. Okay. So, different classes of men, karmis, jnanis, and yogis, right? The karmi is the, the fruit of worker, right? He's working for sense gratification. He wants to enjoy life. We were hearing, we were talking the other day, some people think you only live once, so just enjoy yourself. You know, work and enjoy. You work and make money and go and enjoy yourself, right? That's what people say. So Prabhupada said 99.9% .9 are doing that. They're trying to get sense gratification in different ways. They have different methods of getting sense gratification. Some people get it through industry. They make some industry, build some big industry. Some people do it economic development, make more money for themselves. Economic development just means more sense gratification. Altruism. Altruism means you're working for others' benefit. You, you, you try to, you're thinking about doing good for other people. Like that welfare in work, That's, it's one kind of welfare work, you see, altruism. And political activism, P politics, my party, my party knows how to lead the nation, how to solve all the problems in the nation. You know, politicians, they're very good in giving promises. If you vote for my party, I promise you, our country will have full employment and you'll make a lot of money and you'll live very happily and we'll build nice houses for you and we'll keep the country very peaceful and oh, they give so many promises. This is politics. So all these activities are all based on just pleasing the body, the senses. And, but there's no thought about God consciousness. There's no thought about God being the proprietor. They're thinking, no, it belongs to me, or it belongs to my, my community, or it belongs to my country, belongs to my party. <laughs> like that. This is it. They're thinking. So these three different kinds of people, they're all do, engaged in sense gratification. Not only the karmi, the karmis, he's, of course, he's the, the most people, most people are karmis. Many more, there's many more karmis than there are jnanis and yogis. You know, yogis, not very many, right? And jnanis, jnanis, so they're the ones who have given up trying to enjoy the material life. The jnani is renounced. He's, he's, he's just trying to get He's trying to get liberation. His goal is to get moksha, to get liberation, free from the material world. But the karmi is thinking he wants to enjoy the material world. So the karmi he's trying to enjoy the material world. The jnani he's trying to renounce the material world. And the yogi, he wants to get mystic powers. He wants to be become like a god himself. He wants to control the material world. <laughs> so none of them are peaceful because they all want sense gratification. Only the devotee is actually peaceful because the devotee, he doesn't have any material desire. Is this clear to everybody? Any questions? Maharaj, one yeah. question. Yes. 
Maharaj, can we can we consider like Hiranyakasipu, Ravana, and all this? They are also after sense gratification, after doing so much of uh, austerities and tapasya and all that. Maharaj. Oh, absolutely, absolutely! All those big demons—they're all interested in sense gratification. Haranyakashipu, Ravana, they all want to control the material world, they want to enjoy. Haranyakashipu, his name means, you know, Haranya means gold and Kashipu means a soft bed. So this was his, this was his thinking in life. He wants to enjoy money and the soft bed and sleep. The jnani, his enjoyment comes in going away from the world and just giving up the material. He's thinking about liberation though. He wants free of the material world, he wants liberation. The yogi, he wants some kind of mystic power. Yogis, they can get mystic powers, they can come, become very small or they can, can become very big. They can go against the laws of nature. So this is all sense gratification. And because they want sense gratification, they can never be peaceful. Hmm? Jolene, is that all right? Jol Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Ma Maharaj, also one more question, Maharaj. Uh -huh. uh, how do we consider Dhruva Maharaj? Maharaj. Because he, he did austerity to gain some something like his father to become a king or something like that. And then at the end he, he became a, like a devotee, he didn't want that and he wanted to become a devotee and but God did it. Okay. So in Bhagavad Gita Krishna describes four kinds of people who surrender to him. And one of the kind uh, those people who are in search of wealth. So Dhruva Maharaj was in search of a kingdom. That's like, you know, wanting wealth. So, but still he's, he had a lot of piety, he did a lot of pious activities to get that. He had a lot of sukriti, we would call sukriti, means pious activities. So he, he, he wanted, in the beginning he wanted to get a kingdom. But after he did all his austerities and penances, then he overcame that desire and he just wanted devotional service. So in the beginning he had some material desires, it wasn't pure devotion, but he became pure. Yeah? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Hare Krishna Maharaji, yes. You have a question? Um, yes, I am just wondering, I do not know how to classify a person who likes to engage himself in dark magic, because he comes under the karmis or the yogis. He, he, he does black magic? Yeah. You know, putting spell on people. Mm -hmm. Do they come under karmis or yogis? Yeah, they're tantrics actually. They're called tantrics. People who oh, use I black see. magic, they have a special name. They're called tantrics. Tantrics. Mm. Oh, I see. Mm. Thank you. Tantrics. T A N T R I C S. Yes. Mm. They do tantra, tantra yoga. Use the mantras to do these kind of things. Mm. Ah, okay. So it's material. It's not spiritual, of course. And so material things mean it's all done for some sense gratification. Mm. That's why I was thinking whether people who engage themselves in tantrics are getting are focused on vidya, knowledge even more dangerous than misguided. Yes, right. More dangerous. Okay, we'll go ahead. Jolene, you can read this next paragraph in the language Bhagavad Gita. In the language of the Bhagavad Gita, chapter 7, text 15, people who are engaged in gross sense gratification are mutas or asas. The as is a symbol of stupidity. 
Those who simply engage in the profitless pursuit of sense gratification are worshipping a media, according to Sri Isomarisan. And those who play the role of helping this sort of civilization in the name of educational advancement are actually doing more harm than those who are on the platform of gross sense gratification. The advancement of learning by a godless people is as dangerous as a valuable jewel on the hood of a cobra. A cobra decorated with a valuable jewel is more dangerous than one not decorated. In the Hari Bhakti Sudhudaya, the advancement of education by a godless people is compared to decorations on a dead body. In India, as in many other countries, some people follow the customs of leading a procession with a decorated dead body for the pleasure of the lamenting relatives. In the same way, modern civilization is a patchwork of activities meant to cover the perpetual miseries of material existence. All such activities are aimed towards sense gratification, but above the senses in the mind and above the mind is the intelligence and above the intelligence is the soul. Thus the aim of real education should be self-realization, realization of the spiritual values of the soul. Any education which does not lead to such realization must be considered a media or a new science. And to culture such new science means to go down to the darkest region of ignorance. Okay. Thank you, Maharaj. Thank you very much. So Srila Prabhupada is explaining to us here about the modern society, how we're so much concerned with sense gratification. And we try to su we try to cover up the suffering which is there in the material world. You know, we just we try to pretend, oh it's not really happening or don't worry about it, it will go away soon, it should be over. You know, like now we're suffering from the, this virus. So we say, oh, it's okay, just wait for a little while, it will soon go away, it will soon be over. But we don't know. We see, the miseries of material life will certainly still be here. Right? What, what are the miseries of life? Do you know, Jolene? What are the miseries of material life? Which are there for everyone? And the time? This, uh, a desire that is unfulfilled? No, not, not exactly that. I was thinking more. <coughs> the miseries of material life mean old age, disease, death. Ah. These things. This is the misery of life, you know. This is a real problem which is there for everyone. That we're all get everyone is aging and we're going to suffer disease and we're going to we know we have to die. Right? So this is the problem. So Srila Prabhupada gives a very a strong message here. He talks about sense, this desire for sense gratification is making us into people engaged in sense gratification, they become like donkeys. They become very foolish that just for the sake of sense gratification we, we will cultivate so much ignorance. The name of educational advancement does us more harm than good. And he, and he said, just like you put a jewel on the head of a cobra, it's more dangerous than if there's no jewel, right? Because then when there's a jewel on the head of the cobra, we're all attracted by the jewel. We want to see that jewel, we want to get it even if we can. But if there's no jewel on the head of the cobra, oh, you just go away, just leave it, oh, it's a cobra, get away from here, quick, you know, chase it away, or go away, run away. But when the jewel is there, oh, it's got a jewel, maybe we can get the jewel. So modern c civilization is like that. Educational advancement has done us more harm than good, because we've become so attracted 
by that education. We're thinking it's so important, but the real education is lacking. And the real education is to understand the, that there's God, there's a God behind this world, and that we're meant to be his servants. This is a problem. This is lacking. So the, the, then Prabhupada goes on talking about the advancement of education. It's like decorating a dead body. Now when the body's dead, does it do any good to decorate it? <laughs> you know, who cares? The body's dead. Well, who cares if it's decorated or not? Yeah. They want to decorate the body for the pleasure of the, the relatives. Oh, he looks so nice, right, before, before the cremation. Oh, he, or she looked very nice. Her face was all decorated with makeup and lipstick and everything. But they're going, they're going to burn their body. What's the point? So it's modern civilization is like that. It's a patchwork of activities. We try to cover up the miseries, to cover up the inevitable facts of life, that there is old age, there is disease, there is death. And, but we're only thinking about sense gratification. So then Prabhupada gives us this uh, hierarchy. All ac activities are based on the senses. Above the senses is the mind, and above the mind is the intelligence, and above the intelligence is the soul. So the real aim of education should be to understand the values of the soul, to realize the spiritual value of the soul. Self-realization, knowing ourself, we're souls. So if education just makes us more attached to the body, that's not education, that's avidya, that's nations. But we often find that, we go to college, we go to uni and study, we become more bodily conscious. And so we just simply became more ignorant. Okay, we'll go ahead. Who's there to read? Nara Narayan Prabhu, are you there? Hare Krishna Maharaj, yes Maharaj, I'm okay. here. Okay, you read, according to Bhagavad Gita. According to the Bhagavad Gita 2.42, 7.15, mistaken mundane educators are known as Veda Vada Ratha and Mayaya Parutha Jnana. They may also be atheistic demons, the lowest of men. Those who are Veda, Vada, Ratha post themselves as very learned in the Vedic literature. But unfortunately, they are completely diverted from the purpose of the Vedas. In the Bhagavad Gita 15.15, it is said that the purpose of the Vedas is to know the personality of Godhead. But these Veda, Vada, Ratha men are not at all interested in the personality of Godhead. On the contrary, they are fascinated by such fruitive results as the attainment of heaven. Okay, so Prabhu, Prabhupada is quoting from the Bhagavad Gita. He talks about mistaken mundane educators, <laughs> right? First of all, you have the Veda Vadarata. Veda Vadarata means those people who, they, they, they say they know the Vedas. And they may speak the Vedas, but they don't really understand the purpose of the Vedas. So they're wrong, they're, they're totally wrong in their understanding of the Vedic knowledge. And they don't follow the real purpose of the Vedas, but they speak, they speak and they quote the Vedas. So they're called Vedavatara. And then the other mundane educator is the Maya Aparita Jnana. Maya Aparita Jnana. In the Bhagavad Gita, Krishna describes four kinds of people who don't surrender to him 
And one of them is this maya aparita jnana, means one whose knowledge, jnana is knowledge, one whose knowledge is stolen by illusion, right? So maya aparita jnana, one whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. So then Prabhupada first talks about this Veda Vadarata, that they're speaking about the Vedas, but they don't know the Veda. They don't know the purpose of the Vedas. The purpose of the Vedas is to understand Krishna. But the Veda Vadarata people, they are just only interested in. What are they interested in? What does it say? Nantini. Veda Vadarata men, what, what do they want? Where do they want to go? Do they want to go? Huh? Yeah, they want to go, and the fruit of activity, they want to go to heaven, right? They want to enjoy the heavenly opulence. No, they hear, oh, in heaven, oh, it's very opulent. Oh, the women are very beautiful there. Oh, they can live a long time, or you can get, you can drink somaras, it's very intoxicating, you'll really enjoy. And so they want that kind of enjoyment. That's through the activity. Right? Okay. Narayan, go Maharaj. on. Yes. Maharaj, can I ask you one, uh, one question, Maharaj? Okay. Maharaj, that one so-called scholar who's now misleading using the Vedas, uh, always comes out in the modern age, like today, like Zakir Naik. Is he one of those people, Maharaj? Oh, I'm not familiar with the man you're speaking about. I, that, He's you a Muslim scholar. He always uses the Veda, like Bhagavad Gita and all. He quotes only half the sentence and half he doesn't quote, and he always misguides the people like that. He always what? He used the Vedas like the Bhagavad Gita and all. He used only the two verses, the two lines, and the below two lines he won't use, and he always quote the Bhagavad Gita to convince the other Hindus to convert into Islam. Oh, to convert to Islam. And talk about him. Well, <laughs> well, there's. Do you, we, can we consider him to be that uh, Veda Vadarata or Maya Yaparthanyana? Yeah, maybe Maya Aparitagyana. Yeah, maybe. Maya Aparitagyana, one who gives his own interpretation of the scripture. He gives his own interpretation. You see, we're not, we're not against the teachings of the Quran. You know, one, I know one man in Calcutta, he's an English teacher, he's a Muslim, and he wrote a book, the Bhagavad Gita and the Quran. And he said that the teachings are the same. The message which is in the Bhagavad Gita is practically almost the same as what's in the Quran. Hmm. And he showed so many comparisons. He compared different parts of the Quran to the Bhagavad Gita. So why why you would want to convert? You're already following Bhagavad Gita. Why you need to go to something else? It's only one God. And so the Maya Aparita Jnana, one whose knowledge is stolen by illusion. We're thinking I'm right, you're wrong. <laughs> yeah, it's all the same thing. So somebody is giving that kind of message of Bhagavad Gita, that they're preaching like that. That's like Maya Aparita Jnana. Okay, go ahead. Narayan, as stated. As stated in Mantra 1, we should know that the Personality of Godhead is the proprietor of everything and that we must be satisfied with our own allotted portions of necessity of life. The purpose of all Vedic literature is to awaken this God consciousness in the forgetful living living being. And this same purpose is presented in various ways in the different scriptures of the world for the understanding of a foolish mankind. Thus, this ultimate purpose of all religions is to bring one back to Godhead. You see, we were just talking about this. Prabhupada saying the same thing. The same purpose is presented in various ways in the different scriptures of the world for the understanding of a foolish mankind. And so this, the message of the scriptures is the same. The, the revealed scriptures are giving the same message, but we have to 
surrender to God, we should be the servant of God, we should worship God. The ultimate purpose, to bring one back home to Godhead. So that there's no real conflict, we're not against. Prabhupada said, God is one, religion is also one. We make the differences. Somebody designates himself a Hindu, somebody a Muslim, somebody a Christian, but there's only one God, one religion. A religion is to love God. That's the real religion, to love God. Okay, well, go ahead. Narayan, go ahead. Can you read? But the Veda Vada Ratha people, instead of realizing that the purpose of the Vedas is to revive the forgetful soul's lost relationship with the personality of Godhead, take it for granted that such side issues as the attainment of heavenly pleasure for sense gratification, the lust for which causes their material bondage in the first place, are the ultimate end of the Vedas. Such people misguide others by misinterpreting the Vedic literature. Sometimes they even condemn the Puranas which are authentic explanation for laymen. The Veda Vada Rathas give their own explanation of the Vedas, neglecting the authority of great teachers, Acharyas. They also tend to raise some unscrupulous person from among themselves and present him as the leading exponent of Vedic knowledge. Such Veda Vada Rathas are especially condemned in this mantra by the very appropriate Sanskrit word Vidyayam Ratha. Vidyayam refers to the study of the Vedas because the Vedas are the origin of all knowledge, Vidya. And Ratha means those engaged. Vidya, vid, vidya Yam Rata thus means those who engaged in the study of the Vedas. The so-called student of the Vedas are condemned hearing because they are ignorant of the actual purpose of the Vedas on account of their dis, dis, disobeying the Acharyas. Such Veda Vada Rathas search out meanings in every word of the Vedas to suit their own purposes. They do not know that the Vedic literature is a collection of extraordinary books that can be understood only through the chain of disciplic succession. Thank you Prabhu. Okay. Thank you. So, you have to understand everything through the disciplic succession. This is very important. We just try to understand by our own knowledge. Prabhupada is describing here the, how these people, Veda Vadaratas, they try to give some meaning, every word, to suit their own purposes. They don't follow the real purpose of the Vedic literature. Right? The real purpose of the Vedas is to bring us back to Godhead. But they give some, they're, they're, they don't, they're not interested in going back to Godhead. They just want heavenly pleasure. They want to go to the higher planets. They want to enjoy the life in the heavenly planets. They're thinking that's the goal of life. And so people have that many, there are many people like this. They have this understanding. In Chinese culture also, they always speak about heaven, going to heaven. And Christianity also, they talk about heaven, going to heaven. Of course, their idea of heaven, that they will live there forever. But the Vedas describe you go to heaven, you enjoy there for a long time, then you come back. So they misinterpret the Vedic literature. It's very hard to understand Krishna from the Vedas. But very easy to know, to understand Krishna from the devotee. So you need the touch of the devotee, you need the help of the devotees. So these people, sometimes they even, can, they can criticize the other scriptures like the Puranas. Not only the Vedas, but the Puranas also. 
and they give their own meanings to everything. So, in this mantra, we have the word vidyayam rataha, meaning those engaged in the culture of knowledge or the study of the Vedas, right? They're engaged in the study. So they're condemned. These people are condemned because they don't know the real purpose of the Vedas. They don't follow the teachers, they don't follow the Acharya, they don't have the spiritual master coming in disciplic succession. So we have to hear from the proper channel. But they have their own purposes in mind. They don't understand what are the Vedas. So this is the situation. If you hear from the wrong channel, you hear from the wrong source, then certainly you cannot expect to get the right destination. Just like sometimes you ask people the way, you know, you can't just rely on one person. You ask one person, you better ask two more people to make sure they're right. <laughs> so, we, we want to know the right path, we have to get the proper knowledge from the proper person. The proper person is the one coming in the disciplic succession. He is heard from his teacher, and his teacher heard from his teacher, and the original teacher is Krishna. So like that, we have to get knowledge from the proper person. Okay, who would like to read next? Some Maharaj Hare Krishna. Yes. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Yes. Okay. Yes, please. One must approach the bona fide spiritual master in order to understand the transcendental message of the Vedas. That is the direction of the Mukunda Upanishads 1.2.12. This Veda, Veda Rata people, however, have their own Acharyas who are not in the chain of transcendental succession. Thus, they progress into the darkness regions of the ignorance by misinterpreting the Vedic literature. They fall even further into the ignorance than, than those who have no knowledge of the Vedas at all. Oh, you see, the people who, they're, they're studying the Vedas, but they're giving their own meaning, and they have their own Acharya, they say, no, we have our own teachers, we have our own disciplic succession. <laughs> you see, they have it all, they have everything, but it's all wrong, it's all bogus. <laughs> so. Oh, it's such a problem, difficult to preach to them. They have their disciplic succession, they have their gurus, their acharyas, they are using scriptures, but from the wrong source. So, they go really, it's really hard to convince them. Better if they don't know anything at all then it's much easier to teach people. But if they know something, if they think they know something, then it's very difficult. Just like if you're a piano teacher and somebody comes to you and they can't play the piano, they never played the piano, then you may teach them quite easily. But if somebody comes and they've learned to play the piano a little, from somebody else, they learn something, little things, then it's very hard to teach them. Because they already learned something, they already think they know th something. Very hard to teach them. Better they don't know anything. When you have the blank slate, then it's easier to teach people. But if people think they know something, and they've got it all wrong, it's very hard to get them back onto the right track. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we've heard about the Veda Vadarata people, how they want to go to heaven, they want their sense gratification in heaven. Now we're going to hear about the Maya Aparita Gyanas. Go ahead, Manaji, the lady who was just reading, what, who was it? What's your name? Kundalata Mataji. Kundalata Mataji, please. Maya Aparita Gyanas. 
the maya ya aparatha jnana class of men are self made gods such a man think that they themselves are god and that they is worshiping any other god they will agree to worship a ordinary man if he happen to be rich but they will never worship the personality of goddess such a man uh, unable to recognize their own foolishness never consider how it is that god can be interpreted by maya his own illusory energy if god may ever interpret by maya maya would be more powerful than god such a man say that god is all powerful but they do not consider that if he is all powerful there is no possibility of his being overpowered by maya this self made gods cannot answer all these questions very clearly they are simply satisfied to have become god themselves okay so the, the maya aparita jnana is being described and prabhupada said <laughs> they are self made gods they make themselves into a god because they think themselves god and that there's no need they think we are i am myself from god why i should worship some other god if you ask them to worship krishna or like that, they say, oh i am myself god why i should go and worship him <laughs> they think like that some people they think we're all god i'm god you're god i'm god yeah why we have to, you know, he's also god okay but i'm also god no need to worship him they will agree to worship an ordinary man if he's rich but they will never worship the personality of god personality of god is the most rich but they're thinking this other man who's rich maybe we can get his money so we'll worship him such men unable to recognize their own foolishness never consider how god can be entrapped by maya his own illusory energy right if we if everybody is god but here we are we're in maya why don't we know we're god they say oh because you're in maya you've forgotten that we're god we become illusioned so that means you know if i'm supposed to be god but i've fallen into maya that means maya is more powerful than me and if i'm god that means maya is more powerful than god so these kind of men they say yes god is all powerful but if he's all powerful why is it we fell into maya means maya is more powerful <laughs> so so it's so foolish because maya is the energy of god so the energy can cannot be more powerful than the person the person the god is the energetic the energy comes from him so the maya can be more powerful than god himself so these self made gods they cannot answer all these questions they simply satisfied to become god no no i am myself god don't argue with me don't disturb me so this is their thinking maya aparita gyanas knowledge stolen by illusion they th they're thinking we're god but i've forgotten it everybody's god i've just forgotten it i'm in illusion maya is more powerful than god so we say like that maya vadis <laughs> maya vadi one whose knowledge is stolen by illusion any questions about this mantra maharaj one question maharaj can can we consider this category of people as uh, the soul killers atmaha yes yes definitely soul killers atmaha yeah okay yeah, maharaj yeah. they're definitely they're going into darkest regions of ignorance so their atmaha this is the result they get the fruit the results of their own actions 
as you sow, so shall you reap. You know, they, they, so, they, so this, they did these things, so they have to get the reaction. They'll go into the darkest region of ignorance because they denied the existence of God. So that's how it is, you get the reaction. So we want to be very careful not to be bewildered by these kind of men, this kind of people. Maya aparita jnana. <laughs> Knowledge stolen by illusion. And Vedavada rata, people who simply mouth the Vedas. They're only talking about the Vedas. They don't really know what is the real purpose behind the Vedas. So that is the problem. Okay, so wait, I have, should have some question. I have one, one question we want to look at. Hmm. Okay, here's, here's a question. Can everyone see this question? Can you see the question? Hare Krishna? Yes, Maharaj. Yeah? Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Yes, Maharaj. Okay, good. I'll just make it a bit bigger. Okay. Because we were talking about taking our quarter, remember, from the first mantra. Mantra 1, everything belongs to God, one should accept therefore only those things necessary for yourself. Don't take more knowing who, to whom it belongs, right? So the question is, how do we draw a line between working to keep a job and over endeavouring? Because sometimes, you know, we, we have a job, we, have, we work so hard. We do, people say, oh, I have no time to chant, I have no time to go to temple, I have no time to read, don't even have time for my family. How do we know if we are working too hard to get a quota which is not really possible, meant, which is not really meant for us? You know, sometimes, you know, we're thinking my, our quota. But sometimes what we think is our quota is much more than what we actually need. <laughs> you know, we have that tendency, we, we, we want to get a big, a big share. We're not, we don't want a small quota, we want a big quota. And so we're working very hard trying to get that. Sometimes retrenchment happens for people who do not or cannot perform to meet their employees' expectations or demands. And that's a big danger, especially just now where the economy is not good, though it's very difficult to please the employers, to keep them happy. They're, you know, they're trying to minimize their expenses. And so if you don't work very hard, they don't want you in the company. Sometimes it's not about the extra money, but we need to keep a job. So if we are required to work harder or longer or with more intensity, we tend to oblige because we need the job to survive, right? Yeah, I mean, it's diff nowadays difficult. If you, if, if, you need a if you don't have a job, it's quite hard to get a job because the economy is down all over the world. So you have to keep a, you want to keep your job because you have family, you're de depending on you, you know, maybe you're the breadwinner for the family. You don't want to lose a job. So you have to, you work more, harder, you try harder. You don't want to be kicked out of the job. But how do we know? What should we do? You know, sometimes you work so hard, you're so tired, 
and you, you even get a bad mood at night, you come home, you have a hard day, you come home at night, you're so tired and, oh, you know, maybe the boss has been uh, uh, nasty to you, so you come home at night, you, you, you're not in a good mood and, you know, the children are there and, wow, you just, you don't want to be bothered, right? So, what do you think? What, what should we do in this situation? What's proper? Should we try to keep the job? Or is it better to give up the job? Just go and live in the mountains. Go and live in the mountains, find a hut somewhere, get a little piece of land, grow some vegetables, live simply. How do we know what's our quota? What do you say? Should they work hard or should they not work hard? Should they just concentrate on being a devotee and just say, I'm not going to, I'm sorry, I've got to go home on time, I can't work extra. No, no, I'm not going to work overtime, I'm going home. I'll come back tomorrow, I'll work full day, but I'm not working overtime. <laughs> you have to be a little bold, right, to speak like that to the boss. And the boss may say, oh, you're not going to work overtime, eh? then I don't need you, go and get somebody else. And you can tell the boss, you can get somebody else, but you won't get anybody to do the job as good as me. I know the job, I'm doing the job well. What do you do in this kind of situation? What's the proper thing to do? Should we sacrifice everything to keep the job? Even sacrifice your marriage, your family life? What do you think? Let me hear. What do the marriages say? I think it's very important to draw the line as to how much you would like to sacrifice. Yes. How do you do it? If you think that you have sacrificed more but your boss do not appreciate it's time to look for another job. Okay. I think you need to draw a line to how much you would be able to sacrifice. You mean how much in terms of uh, endeavour, personal I... endeavour in the job, yeah? Yep, yep. A certain, certain limit you have to go. But, you know, yep. it, it will vary, of course, if somebody like, you know, if, if, you're, if you have a lot of people depending on you, you know, maybe like you're taking care of your old mother and father and you have children of your own and everything, you know? Isn't it a bit, don't we have to think about these things as well? Yes, uh, we do need to think about it. But I think if the pressure has reached its limit, then it's time to plan for a move to another job. That you don't plan towards uh, being able to sustain and as well being able to uh, do spirit, uh, do spiritual work as well as you know. You have to balance all of it. You have to plan ahead. Well, is it possible to get other jobs at this time? You know, at the particular time. You know, sometimes it's hard to get job. Very competitive. So many people are looking for jobs at this time. That, you know, because there's the whole economy is down. Everything, everything's been stagnant for some time. Tourism has all stopped. Many hotels have closed. And there's no events taking place in the hotels, no meetings or anything going on. So, you know, it's really, uh, in, you know, it's not very uh, an encouraging situation. Are you sure you you would just give up the job and go off and maybe find another, maybe find another job? Hare Krishna, anybody there? Hare 
Krishna Maharaj, can I try Maharaj? Yeah, please. I want to hear from you. Uh, Maharaj, maybe we should know how to balance our spiritual life and the material life. Okay, and then depend on Krishna and pray that uh, our um, work uh, problems is getting solved. Because it's not easy to get another job at the moment. Actually, I'm going through that problem now. <laughs> You're looking for a job? No, no, I'm not looking for the job. I'm trying to balance uh, the work and the spiritual life oh, oh, okay. as much as I can. Yeah, yeah, you're trying to balance right now. Okay, you have a job yeah. that you, you want to balance with your spiritual yeah. life. Yeah. Mm. Yeah, it's really difficult for, for everyone, I think, at this time especially. It's really not easy to know what to do and how to balance the two. That on one side, you know, you want to have a spiritual life, you want to be able to chant and, and, and spend some time hearing and so on. But at the same time, you're also, you have demands on you in the job. You know, maybe working in a factory or something, it's difficult. <laughs> 